Hello, students. It is I, Professor Void. I'm super excited on what we have for today. You see, first off, if you are new here, my name is Professor Void, and what I do, what I like to do, is to dive into this wonderful thing called Wikipedia. And we discover so many things that it has to offer, the different articles, and just the different stories that come along with it. Especially for today. You see, today we are focusing on some of the scariest articles out there. Some true, some fake, some urban legends, some myths, all for you. And we're gonna go along and dive into this and see what the internet has to offer. Usually what we do is always we dive into the Wikipedia article and then we see what the sources that they bring to dive into deeper details into each one. The Donner Party. Now we kind of skimmed this yesterday. So there are, so we are going to be repeating kind of a little bit of what I've been saying and that's gonna be okay. I'm super excited to see what will be transpiring today? Because so far from what I've learned is that this involves a huge journey for uh, well, some of the pioneers going out west and the, trekking through the wildernesses. The wildernesses? The wilderness would be the best way to say it. Frankly, their journey was simply awful, unbearable. People died, people starved, people ate. But what they ate, well, we're gonna figure that out. Figure that out. We are going to discover what, in the worst possible ways, people trying to create a new life, whether it be good or bad, and head out west. And what seemed to be some of the hardest journey of just people simply just trying to start a new life. I'm very excited. And again, we're going to be doing this all of October. So like if you have submissions, comments, any, um, whether it be through just true crime, whether it be, um, facts or urban legends, or just simply scary stories specifically coming from the Wikipedia, because you know, that's what we like to do, please. Submit, um, go ahead and put a comment, join our live chat, and let's get into it. All right. Let's have our nice little showman, Brian, here. Reintroduce us. The Donner Party, sometimes called the Donner Reed Party, was a group of American pioneers who migrated to California in a wagon train from the Midwest. Delayed by a multitude of mishaps, they spent the winter of 1846. 1847 snowbound in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Some of the migrants resorted to cannibalism to survive, eating the bodies of those who had succumbed to starvation, sickness and extreme cold. The Donner mm -hmm. Party departed Missouri on the Oregon Trail in the spring of 1846, behind many other pioneer families who were attempting to make the same overland trip. The journey west usually took between four and six mix. months, but the Donner Party was slowed after electing to follow a new route called the Hastings Cutoff. Which I passed established Just trails and instead this. crossed the Rocky Mountains Wasatch Range and the Great Salt Lake Desert in present day Utah. The desolate and rugged terrain, and the difficulties they later encountered while traveling along the Humboldt River in present day Nevada, resulted in the loss of many cattle and wagons, and divisions soon formed within the group. By early November, the migrants had reached the Sierra Nevada but became trapped by an early, heavy snowfall near Truckee Lake, now Donna Lake high in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Their food supplies ran dangerously low, and in mid-December some of the group set out on foot to obtain help. Rescuers from California attempted to reach the migrants, but the first relief party did not arrive until the middle of February 1847, almost four months after the wagon train became trapped. Of the 87 members of the party, 48 survived the ordeal. Historians have described the episode as one of the most fascinating tragedies in California history, and in the entire record of American westward migration. Let's fucking... 
Um, page 15, Stuart. See, I wish there was like link a new tab. Yeah, see, no, it doesn't allow you to do the thing. It's kind of stupid. Oh, thank you. Out of 87 members of the party, 48 survived. And now, if I know math, that's above a 50. So net positive. Like, you know, you got to take what, what you can get. Resorting to cannibalism? Hey, I'd say, you know, they picked themselves up by the bootstraps and ate them. <laughs> All right. Let's get into what happened back, back in the journey to the West. Background. During the 1840s, the United States saw a dramatic increase in settlers who left their homes in the East to resettle in the Oregon Territory or California which at the time were accessible only by a very long sea voyage or a daunting overland journey across the American frontier. Some, such as Patrick Breen, saw California as a place where they would be free to live in a fully Catholic culture. Others were attracted to the West's burgeoning economic opportunities or inspired by the idea of manifest destiny. The belief that the land between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans belonged to European Americans and that they should settle it. Mo yeah, maybe this might actually end up being a good story. <laughs> Most wagon trains followed the Oregon Trail route from a starting point in Independence, Missouri, to the Continental Divide of the Americas, traveling about 15 miles, 24 kilometers, a day on a journey that usually took between four and six months. The trail generally followed rivers to South Pass, a mountain pass in present-day Wyoming which was relatively easy for wagons to negotiate. From there, pioneers had a choice of routes to their destination so four between four and six months i'm curious i'm curious because i want to get more and more background onto it so like what um here just in case i don't pop up of any of my nasty stuff you know what's up, I don't want you to, I want y'all to see none of my nasty bits. Now, hold up now. So, like, what, uh, Tracer from the East, Californian Trail. Oh, this is kind of cool. A little bit of, a little bit of knowledge here. Fuck. Oh my gosh. Bright ass light. Jesus. These were built ports. And so, Oregon City. You got the fort. Independence. Oh, Independence. Wyoming. So, oh, this is where they started. Cool, cool, cool. We have a map. We have a map. So, Independence, that is where our story is going to start. We get into Independence Rock. And then, I'm guessing they kind of take this and they go into there. They take a little bit of that and they do a little bit of this, right? That doesn't seem so bad. That's a... Um, that's a three hour drive. I don't know what like people are freaking out about. So let's keep that there. Cool. Oh shit, they were farther. Oh, okay. So, okay, okay, okay. Now, where is when I'm guessing certain shit gets pretty dicey under these parts. California Trail, Oregon Trail, Modern International Borders. Modern. Okay, 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 okay. So they went into independent. Oh, wow. Okay, that's a lot farther. That is a lot, lot farther. So we're gonna we're gonna get like a nice little bit of like compilation here, just so you all know what's going down. So that is at Donner Lake, California. Okay, so something happened now there where they got a nice little bit of a look at all those peeps. Look at all that. There's the lake, and then that's where they ate his brother. <laughs> Currently, right now, what we're seeing here on their journey, it looks pretty good. Like you hang out with a bunch of rivers, you're doing good, you're doing good there until you get maybe into like some mountain, mountainy type dirty, tab dirty stiff. So, okay. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say right past the Great Lakes is where things get a little naughty. Maybe. We shall see. Ooh, I'm excited. Okay, okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. All right. So let us continue where we were off. Um, 
Most wagon trains followed the Oregon Trail route from a starting point in Independence, Missouri, to the Continental Divide of the Americas, traveling about 15 miles, 24 kilometers, a day on a journey that usually took between four and six months. The trail generally followed rivers to South Pass, a mountain pass in present-day Wyoming which was relatively easy for wagons to negotiate. From there, pioneers had a choice of routes to their destinations. Which would be the continue the Oregon Trail or going into the California Trail. Now, okay, it said wagon train. Okay, I know, uh, I know it's, I know it's a lot, but right now I just want to see, like, what were these all about? Holy shit! So it's a big, it's a big party. Like you really had whole neighborhoods get up and leave into their thing, and up and left, and they created camps, baggage trains. Okay, 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 okay. Hey, you know what? We're gonna add this. We gotta. I want to know what their transportation is. This is how we do things here. Okay. Like, I want to know the full context of this, all right? Now, we got to figure out how brutal it was for them. The wagon train. Wagon train. From Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. This article includes a list of general references, but it remains largely unverified because it lacks sufficient corresponding inline citations. Please okay. help to improve this article by introducing more precise citations. May 2012, learn how and when to remove this template message. A wagon train is a group of wagons traveling together. Before the extensive use of military vehicles, baggage trains followed an army with supplies and ammunition. In the American West, settlers traveling across the plains and mountain passes in covered wagons banded together for mutual assistance. Although wagon trains are associated with the Old West, the trek boars of South Africa also traveled in caravans of covered wagons. Okay. In migration, transit, traces and trails. Wagon trains followed several trails in the American West, with virtually all originating at Independence, Missouri. Perhaps the most famous wagon train trail was the Oregon Trail which had a span of over 2,000 miles, nice. 3,200 kilometers. Other paths included the Santa Fe Trail, the Chisholm Trail, the California Trail, which split southwestward from the Oregon Trail, the Mormon Trail, and the Old Spanish Trail. Although wagon train suggests a line of wagons, when terrain permitted, wagons would often fan out and travel abreast to minimize the amount of dust blown onto other wagons. Travel by wagon train oh God, occurred primarily be between the 1840s, 1880s, diminishing after completion of the first transcontinental railroad. Some remnants of wagon ruts along the well-traveled trails are still visible today. Organization. Originally, westward movement began in small groups, but well-funded travelers with a hundred or more wagons could employ professional wagon masters, or trail masters, and ostlers. Overland emigrants discovered smaller groups of 20 to 40 wagons were more manageable than larger ones, especially without professional wagon masters. Teamsters. Many operated under democratic principles, creating bylaws and electing a captain. In reality, a captain had limited authority. His role was largely confined to getting everyone moving in the morning and selecting when and where to camp at night. Membership in wagon trains was generally fluid and wagons frequently joined or left trains depending on the needs and wishes of their owners. An accident or illness, for instance, might force someone to fall behind and wait for the next train, or an emigrant might whip up to overtake a forward train after a quarrel. Some might break away to settle mm -hmm. in Colorado Territory or other territories along the way. At night, wagon trains were often formed into a circle or square for shelter from wind or weather, and to corral the emigrants' animals in the center to prevent them from running away or being stolen by Native Americans. While Native Americans might attempt to raid horses under cover of darkness, they rarely attacked a train. Contrary to popular belief, wagons were seldom circled defensively. Modern day treks. Today, Covered wagon trains are used to give an authentic experience for those desiring to explore the West as it was in the days of the pioneers and other groups traveling before modern vehicles were invented. Indian teams hauling 60 miles to market the 1,100 bushels of wheat raised by the school at Seager Colony, Oklahoma Territory, circa 1900. Bag Hot damn, look at that. And then yeah, you just had like a couple of people just... Sorry, I just got a good tweet. Um, you got a little. I really like that photo. That's really cool. People are lined up, just chilling. Damn. Okay. Baggage trains. The advent of gunpowder warfare meant that an army could no longer rely solely on foraging in the surrounding countryside, 
and required a regular supply of munitions. In the 18th century, organized commissary and quartermaster departments were developed to centralize delivery of supplies. The delivery took the form of baggage trains, large groups of wagons that traveled at the rear of the main army. In popular media, westward-bound collective treks are reflected in numerous books, films and television programs about the journeys. Examples include, Emerson Huff's 1922 novel and James Cruz's silent film based on it, The Covered Wagon, 1923, Raoul Walsh's film The Big Trail, 1930, Robert N. Bradbury's film Westward Ho, 1935, John working. Ford's Wagon Master, <laughs> 1950, and the television series it inspired, Wagon Train, 1957, 1965, Ooh. William Wellman's film, Westward the Women, 1951, A. The B. Guthrie Jr.'s 1949 novel The Way <laughs> West and Andrew V. McLaglan's 1967 kid, film based on it and the Wagons West series of 24 novels written by Noel Gerson, under the pseudonym Dana Fuller Ross, between 1979 and 1989. All right, well, there you go. Okay, so now we know on just what uh, what happens to this. So it's it's usually, if we're talking about, what was it? It's talking about rich people here, or uh, probably the most famous wagon trail, right? Other paths include Santa Fe. Wagon trains is just a line of work. The train permitted, often fan out and trouble. But tra wagon train diminished after the completion of the first transcontinental railroad, which I bet that was wild. And then well-funded travelers, which I'm guessing the Donner Party, the Donner Party was very, very, very well, well, uh, yeah, well established, if I must say. So, for myself. Alrighty. Now, let's get back to it. So now we know what the traveling was for these people. These folks, these p, -p, -p pioneers Donna Park. Nope. Lansford Hastings, an early migrant from Ohio to the West, went to California in 1842 and saw the promise of the undeveloped country. To encourage settlers, he published The Emigrant's Guide to Oregon and California. As an mm -hmm. alternative to the Oregon Trail's standard route through Idaho's Snake River Plain, he proposed a more direct route, which actually increased the trip's mileage, to California across the Great Basin. My dude created the first how-to book. He was the first vlogger to go across to go across the trail and stuff like that because he published the immigrants guide to oregon and california it's kind of cool which would take travelers through the wasatch range and across the great salt lake desert hastings had not traveled any part of his proposed shortcuts until early 1846 on a trip from california to the fort um bridger so wait a minute okay fort bridger wait a he had not traveled any part of his proposed shortcut until 1846. Six. Fort Bridger right here. So, oh, from California to Fort Bridger. So my dude just like hit Cali and said, tell people, just like, yeah, no, go there. <laughs> he didn't help anybody. I know I pointed it out last time, but I just still find it so funny. That the guy is just like, no, 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 go down this place. She's like, have you done it? Yep. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> the fort was scant supply. The fort was a scant supply station run by Jim Bridger and his partner, Louis Vasquez in Black's Fork, Wyoming. Hastings partner. Oh my gosh. Were these, uh, were these lovers it was a mountain man and trader. I bet he was mountain man. It was an American mountain man. They were both mountain men. All right. Hey, I'm happy for you guys. They found a nice little. What was it? They built up a fort up into the mountains so, could they, so they could just love each other. I'm, ha I'm so happy for them. I love that. Hastings stayed at the fort to persuade travelers to turn south on his route. As of 1846, oh. Hastings was the second of two men documented to have crossed the southern part of the Great Salt Lake Desert, but neither had been accompanied by wagons. Arguably the most difficult part of the journey to California was the last 100 miles, 160 kilometers, across the Sierra Nevada. This mountain range has 500 distinct peaks over 12,000 feet, 3,700 meters, high which, 
because of their height and proximity to the Pacific Ocean, receive more snow than most other ranges in North America. Hell the eastern no. side of the range is also notoriously steep. After a wagon train left Missouri to cross the vast wilderness to Oregon or California, timing was crucial to ensure that it would not be bogged down by mud created by spring rains or by massive snowdrifts in the mountains from September onward. Traveling during the right time of year was also critical to ensuring that horses and oxen had enough spring grass to eat. Fam to be honest, like, I'm very happy that, psh, like, we are not doing that anymore. Like, granted, like, you know, you try to you try to take the good with the bad. Like, yay, cool. Like, yes, of course. We're destroying the environment, but also, like, fuck the wagon. Okay? I'm just saying. Just like, we don't really need any of that anymore. Okay? Give me my Tesla and let me drive. Not even drive myself anymore. Just like... My great, 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 whomever it might be, risked their lives and ate their brother. So I can sit here and talk to you and make fun of them. Families, in the spring of 1846, almost 500 wagons headed west from Independence. At the rear of the train, a group of nine wagons containing 32 members of the Reed and Donner families and their employees left on May 12th. George Donner, born in North Carolina, had gradually moved west to Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois, with a one-year sojourn in Texas. In early 1846, he was he about traveled. 60 years old and living near Springfield, Illinois. With him was his 44-year-old wife Tamsun, their three daughters Frances, six, Georgia, four, and Eliza, three, and George's daughters from a previous marriage, Elitha, 14, and Liana, 12. It, my dude was banging. Oh my God. Tamsin, I'm, girl, I hope you survive this. George's younger brother, Jacob, 56, also joined the party with his wife Elizabeth, 45, teenaged stepsons Solomon Hook, 14, and William Hook, 12, and five children, George, 9, Mary, 7, Isaac, 6, Lewis, 4, and Samuel, 1. Like, you got people, uh, you got people having kids, uh, having kids at, like, average age of, like, 30 to 25. I wouldn't say 25, no, I'm mainly thinking Midwest. I would say it's like 40 to 30. You got people in their 60s having kids. Granted, it's the women having the kids and having to raise them. So, And the men were just like, let me just raise them to work my crops. Also traveling with the Donner brothers were Teamsters Hiramo Miller, 29, Samuel Shoemaker, 25, Noah James, 16, Charles Berger, 30, John Denton, 28, and Augustus Spitzer, 30, James F. Reed. And we figured out that Teamsters were the people that, like, manned those coaches, like a lot of horses. So again, really shows how rich the party was. James F. Reed. 45, immigrated from Ireland with his widowed mother during childhood, and moved to Illinois in the 1820s. He was accompanied on the journey by his wife Margaret, 32, stepdaughter Virginia, 13, daughter Martha Jane, Patty, 8, sons James and Thomas, 5 and 3, and Sarah Keyes, Margaret Reed's mother. Keyes was in the advanced stages of consumption, tuberculosis, and died at a campsite they named Alcove Springs. She was oh, buried nice. nearby, <laughs> off to the side of the trail, with a grey rock inscribed Mrs. Sarah Keyes, died May 29, 1846, aged 70 and she That's gotta be like, like when you're going on this trip, just be like, no, I'm gonna chill here. Like, fuck off. <laughs> I don't wanna go on a wagon, on a wagon journey for six months, hell no. Dude, my back starts to ache just for camping a weekend. Like, no. And like, what was it? Like, and you couldn't do, like, you couldn't have the luxury of, what was it? Uh, like, doing the like, oh, I'll drive, I'll drive 12 hours, you drive 12 hours, I'll drive through the night, you drive through the morning, and that type of stuff. There was no five hour energy. 
to get you past that. Nuh uh. There wasn't a pit stop and a restroom um, break and stuff like that. It wasn't old man Bill coming out of the forest with his moonshine. He's like, this would be about a pity of pap. I'm like, no. You had to trek it. Of course they had. But they had money. In addition to leaving financial worries behind, Reed hoped that California's climate would help Margaret, who had oh. long suffered from ill health. The Reeds hired three men to drive the ox teams, Milford, Milt, Elliot, 28, James Smith, 25, and Walter Heron, 25. Bayliss Williams, 24, went along as handyman and his sister, Eliza, 25, as the family's cook. Within a week of leaving independence, the Reeds and Donners joined a group of 50 wagons nominally led by William H. Russell. By June 16, the there company had traveled 450 miles, 720 kilometers, with 200 miles, 320 kilometers, to go before Fort Laramie, Wyoming. They had been delayed by rain and the rising river, but Tamsin Donner wrote to a friend in Springfield, Indeed, if I do not experience something far worse than I have yet done, I shall say the trouble is all in getting started. Young Virginia Reed recalled years later that, during the first part of the trip, she was perfectly happy. Several other families joined the wagon train along the way. Levine that's so eerie i know again i pointed this out uh yesterday but that's still so freaking eerie as hell so i was perfectly happy until i had to eat mm, eat my son he was delicious several other families joined the wagon train along the way Levine. okay i'm sorry i'm gonna have to skip over this part but granted what was it there are um what was it? I think it had to do with a German immigrant. Yeah, these two people, uh, his wife, daughter, and uh, what was it? Two young single men, um, and Spitzer and Reinhardt traveled with another German couple. Totally swingers. All right. Gay couple. Definitely. All right. And um, what was it? Uh, Peggy. Uh, Peggy and stuff like that got fucking seven children fucking what was it wife like they're normies they only got a daughter and a son and then who is the who is the jackass who joined the place with a family of a widow a widow from tennessee headed family of 13 13 let me just say that again 13 13 13 13, 13. that is some wild shit 37 you have 13 kids like you have a business there just start just start a book business just start something build something from there and build off a of child labor and then create the i don't know create the new pencil or something like that's usually how it always was like i couldn't that no two married and two married daughters like the daughter like she was so she was a grandma like just retire off the family people are just like oh what's crowded in tennessee in 1840 fuck off uh these people just wanting more and have to pay so much for their greed was it they also hired a driver a dutch charlie burger an older man named hard coop road with them luke hard uh, harlerin young man sick with consumption could no longer ride horseback the family had been traveling with no longer had resources to care for him he was taken in by george donner and lee and rode in their wagon well, there you go route taken by the oh cool we got a fucking map oh you know how i love my maps all right cool 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 so we're gonna paste that and we're gonna put that there so we got a little bit of uh we got a little bit of a hoo-ha going here you know what a hoo-ha is students it's a fuck <laughs> but so to put it more specifically and it goes up so we're talking about maybe like a little bit there goes down a little bit shoots right back up goes down a little bit right little little dippity dop doop and then bam 
Cool, 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 cool stuff, bro. We like it. We like it. Can I get a background on this bad boy? No, that's fine. It's something like that. It's something like that. A little bit of a stretch of the imagination. I don't know why. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it goes down a little bit farther. And for yeah, that one goes like up. I don't know why that one's going up. I guess that's just like a separate trail. But Hastings cutoff, boom, right there. I like how we're breaking this down. Yeah, down. Like to be honest, like I love it how like we're kind of breaking this down, and like a little bit like an investigation. Like what happened to the family here? Where was Reed? really going oh what was it <laughs> where was reed really going let me tell you okay hastings uh, warned the migrants they could send riders delivered delivers to traveling okay, okay, okay hastings cut off to yep. promote his new route the hastings cut off lansford hastings sent riders to deliver letters to traveling migrants on july 12th the Reeds and Donners were given one of them. Hastings warned the migrants they could expect opposition from the Mexican authorities in California and advised them to band together in large groups. He also claimed to have worked out a new and better road to California, and said he would be waiting at Fort Bridger to guide the migrants along the new cutoff. On July Damn. 20th, at the Little Sandy River, most of the wagon train opted to follow the established trail via Fort Hall. My dude sent out the tweet. Saying, come on down. Meet me at Fort. Meet me at Fort Bridger. Trying to scam these people. A smaller group opted to head for Fort Bridger and oh. needed a leader. Most of the younger men in the group were European immigrants and not considered to be ideal leaders. James Reed had lived in the U.S. for a considerable time, was older, and had military experience. But his autocratic attitude had rubbed many in the party the wrong way, and they saw him as aristocratic, imperious, and ostentatious. By mm. So a jackass. <laughs> so James Reed was a jackass. He was a pompous... He was a pompous little bitch. Right? Mm-hmm. By comparison, the mature, experienced, American-born Donna's peaceful and charitable nature made him the group's first choice. The members uh. of the party were comfortably well off by contemporaneous standards. Although they are called pioneers, most of the party lacked experience and skill for traveling through mountainous and arid land. Additionally, the party had little knowledge about how to interact with Native Americans. I, I just love hearing the buildup. I just love it. I love hearing the buildup of just ultimate utter failure for people that just had no idea what they were doing. Journalist Edwin Bryant reached Black's Fork a week ahead of the Donner party. He saw the first part of the trail and was concerned that it would be difficult for the wagons in the Donner group, especially with so many women and children. He returned to Black's Fork to leave letters warning several members of the group not to take Hastings's shortcut. By the time the Donner party reached Black's Fork on July 27th, Hastings had already left, leading the 40 wagons of the Harlan Young group. Because Jim oh. Bridges' trading post would fare substantially better if people used the Hastings cutoff, he told the party that the shortcut was a smooth trip, devoid of rugged country and hostile native... Where uh, post would fare substantially better if people used... Trading post. Man, these are all people just trying to make a quick back and back devoid of rugged country and hostile Native Americans, and would therefore shorten their journey by 350 miles, 560 kilometers. Water would be easy to find along the way, although a couple of days crossing a 30, 40 mile, 48, 64 kilometers, dry lake bed would be necessary. Reed was very impressed with- And let's see here, what do we got? What do we got? What do we got? Was this near river? Uh, was there like a known river? I'm not seeing rivers. Rivers don't exist on here. <laughs> Reed was very impressed with this information and advocated for the Hastings cut off. None mm. of the party received Bryant's letters warning them to avoid Hastings' route at all costs. In his diary account, Bryant states his conviction that Bridger deliberately concealed the letters, a view shared by Reed in his later testimony. Oh shit, my dude concealed the letters! Bridger, no! Oh no!
At Fort Laramie, Reed met an old friend named James Kleiman who was coming from California. Kleiman warned Reed not to take the Hastings cut off, telling him that wagons would not be able to make it and that Hastings' information was inaccurate. Fellow pioneer Jesse Quinn Thornton traveled part of the way with Donna and Reed, and in his book From Oregon and California in 1848 declared Hastings the Baron Munchausen of travelers in these countries. Tamsin Donna, according to Thornton, was the Baron Munchausen is a fiscal German nobleman created by the German writer Rudolf Eric Rass. In 1785, book Baron Munchausen, narrative of marvelous travels and campaigns in Russia. The character is loosely based on a real Baron. Oh, what? So it's just like, it's a fake, I guess? Maybe. Tamsin Donna, according to Thornton, was gloomy, sad, and dispirited at the thought of turning off the main trail on the advice of Hastings, whom she considered a selfish adventurer. Mm. You see, it's always, it's a lot of, like, in these situations, I feel like it's a lot about, like, like, the wife, uh, the wife coming in and trying to tell the husband, like, yo, what the fuck are you doing? Like, no, we shouldn't be trying to do this. No. No. Like, what would you think? Like, I couldn't, like, you have so many warnings and you're chilling there at the fort. You have plenty of time to look over look over and like chill there it's just oh my gosh on july 31st 1846 the party left black's fork after four days of rest and wagon repairs 11 days behind the leading harlan young group donna hired a replacement driver and the company was joined by the mccutcheon family consisting of 30 year old william his 24 year old wife amanda their two year old daughter harriet and a 16-year-old named Jean Baptiste Trudeau from New Mexico, who claimed to have knowledge of the Native Americans and terrain on the way to California. Oh, that's great. I like that. <laughs> Migration Canyon route of the Hastings Cutoff. Look at that shit. I mean, it's a great view. That's a very pretty view. But you're telling me you gotta send wagons, wagons through there? You're telling me I'm tossing people out there? Uh -uh. Uh, no, no, no. And these are like 50 person. What was this? Oh, no, mind. They they have hotels. Sweet, hell yeah. Cool, 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 cool. Yeah, see, I didn't know that they had that. Okay, but no, they had like a Hilton down there. Fuck yeah. All right, never mind. They're fine. Was watch range. The last obstacle in one's watch range. Okay, where's that? Fort Hall, Soda Springs, Rehill. I'm not seeing like a was a Waz watch spring. Oh, Waz watch mountains. Oh, okay. Wasatch. I'm like Wasatch. Wasatch. Wasatch Range. The Wasatch. party turned south to follow the Hastings cut off. Within days, they found the terrain to be much more difficult than described. Drivers mm. were forced to lock the wheels of their wagons to prevent them from rolling down steep inclines. Oh Several years of traffic on the main Oregon Trail had left an easy and obvious path, whereas the cut off was more difficult to find. Hastings wrote directions and left letters stuck to trees. On August 6th. Oh, thank God. Oh, my dude just fucking just did the classic. <laughs> yeah, just I scratched a couple trees on my long, along the way. My fucking this asshole left like Hansel and Gretel the fucking thing. Like, yeah, no, I dropped some breadcrumbs. You should be totally fine. Like, if the weather <laughs> left letters stuck to trees. Found a letter of him advising him to stop. Oh fuck me. Okay, okay, let's get back into it. Let's get back into it. This jackass. On August 6th, the party found a letter from him advising them to stop until he could show them an alternate route to the taken by the Harlan Young party. Reed, Charles T. Stanton, 
and William Pike rode ahead to get Hastings. They encountered exceedingly difficult canyons where boulders had to be moved and walls cut off precariously to a river below, a route likely to break wagons. In his letter Hastings had offered to guide the Donner party around the more difficult areas, but he rode back only part way, indicating the general direction to follow. Stan? <laughs> yeah, just... Just go west. Yeah. You got it? All right? You got it? Just like where? What are you talking about? No, we're like we need like we need specific guidelines. There's val, there's valleys, there's trees, there's rock terrain, and stuff like that. The indigenous people are ready to kill us at any moment, and stuff like that. No, 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 you're good, you're good, you're good. Just like when you see the tree, take a right and then just go west. Cool. Yeah, you got it. You're fine. You you'll be fine. You'll be fine. You'll be. Fine. Motherfucker, this ain't like, <laughs> like when you see the billboard. <laughs> you know, when you see the like big statue and stuff like that, you'll see it. You'll see it. You'll see it. You'll see it. <laughs> Stanton and Pike stopped to rest, and Reed returned alone to the group, arriving four days after the party's departure. Without the guide, they had. Oh, wait, 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 wait. What, 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 what? They encountered exceedingly difficult canyons where boulders had to be moved and walls cut off precariously to a river below, a route likely to break wagons. In his letter Hastings had offered to guide the Donner party around the more difficult areas, but he rode back only part way, indicating the general direction to follow. Stanton okay. and Pike stopped to rest, and Reed returned alone to the group, arriving four days after the party's departure. Without the guide they had been promised, the group had to decide whether to turn back and rejoin the traditional trail, follow turn the tracks left by back. the Harlan Young party through the difficult terrain of Weber Canyon, or forge their own trail in the direction that Hastings had recommended. At Reed's urging, the group chose the new Hastings route. Their progress slowed to Yo, kill Reeds. Kill Reeds. I hope Reeds gets eaten. Okay? Like, I hope they start with the toes first and end up with end up with the back of his neck. Like, what? At Reed's urging, like, no, I want to go on the new trail. Please. I'll give... Please, I want to go to California. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about, dude? This is life and dead. This isn't like a like a quick turnaround. Oh my gosh, I'm just making sure that like everything's kosher. On the good, good. Yeah, okay, we're my bad. Yeah, like what the fuck is this guy talking about? Reed. You son of a bitch. Their progress slowed to about at Reed's urging, the group chose the new Hastings route. Their progress slowed to about one and a half miles, 2.4 kilometers, a day. All able-bodied oh, men shit. were required to clear brush, fell trees, and heave rocks to make room for the wagons. You were making a whole new ass trail. Remove fallen trees. As the Donner Party made its way across the Wasatch Range of the Rocky Mountains, the Graves family, who had set off to find them, reached them. Like, what the... <laughs> like, I turn around and go back home if a, if a branch is out of my neighborhood. Like, honestly, I'm not, like, I'm not getting out of my car to remove it, okay? I don't want to get a splinter. What if a squirrel is in it? Okay, that's just part of Mother Nature. Let's just, like... I'll leave it at that, okay? I don't need any of that bullshit. You're telling me my guys had to heave rocks, fell in trees and clear bush? Nah. I'm good. I'll die in Tennessee. How about that? <laughs> As the Donner Party made its way across the Wasatch Range of the Rocky Mountains, cool. the Graves family, who had set off to find them, reached them. They consisted of... <laughs> Dozen. <laughs> That's not foreshadowing. They consisted of 57-year-old Franklin Ward Graves, his 45-year-old wife Elizabeth, their children Mary, 20, William, 18, Eleanor, 15, oh my Lavina, God. 13, Nancy, 9, Jonathan, 7, Franklin Jr., 5, Elizabeth, 1, and married daughter Sarah, 22, plus son-in-law Jay Fostick, 
23, and a 25-year-old teamster named John Snyder, traveling together in three wagons. In three wagons? You gotta be shitting me. They would not be able to survive that. In three wagons in the Donner Party of 87 members. Holy shit. Oh, right, because of the leg. Because of the, the stupid kids. A whole ass married couple and stuff. Oh, my. Yo, this is some wild. I mean, like, maybe the, like, I guess, like, with the kids, you have more able bodied people so they can, you can really start heaving some shit, but still. Their arrival brought the Donner Party to 87 members in 60, 80 wagons. The Graves okay. family had been part of the last group to leave Missouri, confirming the Donner Party was at the back of the year's western exodus. It was August 20th by the time that they reached a point in the mountains where they could look down and see the Great Salt Lake. It took almost another two weeks to travel out of the Wasatch Range. The men began arguing, and doubts were expressed about the wisdom of those who had chosen this route, in particular James Reed. <laughs> Yeah, I fucking bet. James over here. Gray's coming in just like, dude, why the fuck are we on this trail? Like, we could have been there. Like, we could already been there within a, like a couple of days. Just like, like, now listen here, folks. All right, I don't. We're not trying to point any fingers or anything like that. So... We're just trying to get together so we can pass through these here mountains and then we can get to our next checkpoint. One of the guys like raises a hand like, yes, uh, Jebediah. Uh, Jebediah James. Jingleheimer Schmidt. Yes, um, right, well, since we're not trying to voice opinion, I just want to know. Uh, no, we're just not trying to follow directions from fucking uh, James Reed anymore. I'm just saying, if shit goes south, I'm, I'm eating him. <laughs> that would not happen. <laughs> Food and supplies began to run out for some of the less affluent families. Stanton and Pike had ridden out with Reed but had become lost on their way back. By the time that the party found them, they were a day away from eating their horses. Oh shit. Oh shit, it's happening. It's happening, ladies and gentlemen. They're about to start eating some horses. Great Salt Lake Desert. Luke Halloran died of tuberculosis on August 25th. A few Look days later, that. the party came across a torn and tattered letter from Hastings. The pieces indicated there were two days and nights of difficult travel ahead without grass or water. The party rested their oxen and prepared for the trip. After 36 hours they set off to traverse a 1,000 foot, 300 meters, mountain that lay in their path. From its peak, they saw ahead of them a dry, barren plain, perfectly flat and covered with white salt, larger than the one they had just crossed, and one of the most inhospitable places on earth according to Rarick. Their oxen were already fatigued, and their water was nearly gone. Like that's a wrap, you're telling me you got, like you just got done, like alright cool 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 cool, we're past the mountain, fuck, okay, let's like look over, okay, now what's that on the horizon line? Yeah, let's go ahead and eat James. Get Reed out here, all right? Son, hand me that rock. Thank you. <laughs> the party pressed onward on August 30th, having no alternative. In the heat of the day, the moisture underneath the salt crust rose to the surface and turned it into a gummy mass. The mm. wagon wheels sank into it, in some cases up to the hubs. The days were blisteringly hot and the nights frigid. Several of the group saw visions of lakes and wagon trains and believed they had finally overtaken Hastings. After three days, the water was gone, and some of the party removed their oxen from the wagons to press ahead to find more. Some of the animals were so weakened they were left yoked to the wagons and abandoned. Nine of Reed's ten oxen broke free, crazed with thirst, and bolted off into the desert. Many other families' cattle and horses had also gone missing. The rigors of the is. journey resulted in irreparable damage to some of the wagons, but no human lives had been lost. Instead of the promised two-day journey over 40 miles, 64 yeah. kilometers, the journey across the 80 miles, 130 kilometers, of Great Salt Lake Desert had taken six. Instead of a promise, two-day journey. This bitch took six. 
Yo, this is it, ladies and gentlemen. We're about to see human on human nom nom. None of the party had any remaining faith in the Hastings cutoff as they recovered at the springs on the other side of the desert. They spent cool. several days trying to recover cattle, retrieve the wagons left in the desert, and transfer their food and supplies to other wagons. Reed's family incurred the heaviest losses, and Reed became more assertive, asking all the families to submit an inventory of their goods and food to him. Fuck he suggested off, that two Reed. men should go to Sutter's Fort in California. He had heard that John Sutter was exceedingly generous to wayward pioneers and could assist them with extra provisions. Charles Stanton and William McCutcheon volunteered to undertake the dangerous trip. The remaining serviceable wagons were pulled by mongrel teams of cows, oxen, and mules. It was the middle of September, and two young men who went in search of missing oxen reported that another 40 miles, 64 kilometers, of desert lay ahead. Their cattle and oxen were now exhausted and lean, but the Donner party crossed the next stretch of desert relatively unscathed. The journey seems wow. to get easier particularly through the valley next to the Ruby Mountains. Despite their near hatred of Hastings, oh, they had no the choice storm. but to follow his tracks, which were weeks old. On September 26, two months after embarking on the cutoff, the Donner Party rejoined the traditional trail along a stream that became known as the oh, Humboldt shit. River. The shortcut had probably delayed them by a month. A whole fucking month, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Hell adieu. Oh my gosh, no. Uh, uh no. <laughs> uh, no. Oh boy. And of course, like on this part, you're probably thinking just like, cool, cool, fuck. All right. We're back on the trail. Everything is going to be fine. All right. We just got to get on the trail. Yeah, we lost a couple oxen, but that's okay. People lose oxygen. I... Then in the back of your mind, you're just thinking, what's gonna happen with the others? Are they gonna eat me? Are they gonna eat them? We lost everything. I don't know if there's... Is everything gonna be bad? So I don't know if it's a fucking... I don't know. This is very interesting. Yeah. Rejoining the trail. Rejoining the trail. Reed banished along the Humboldt. Oh. Ah, I love these. These are like episodes. Reed banished. I love Reed that. Reed banished along the Humboldt. The group met Paiute Native Americans who joined them for a couple of days, but stole or shot several oxen and horses. By Shit. now, it was well into October, and the Donner families split off to make better time. Two wagons in the remaining group became tangled, and John Snyder angrily beat the ox of Reed's hired teams to Milt Elliot. When Reed intervened, oh. Snyder proceeded to rain blows down onto his head with a whip handle. Oh. When Reed's wife attempted to intervene... Oh, wait, 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 we got a fight? We got a documented fight? Okay, hold up, wait, what? Two wagons in the remaining group became tangled, and John Snyder angrily beat the ox of Reed's hired teams to Milt Elliot. When Reed intervened, Snyder proceeded to rain blows down onto his head with a whip handle. When Reed's wife attempted to intervene, she too was struck. Reed retaliated by fatally plunging a knife under Snyder's collarbone. Oh, shit! My dude shivved him! Stuart. Thank you, Stuart. What the fuck? Rorick. What the fuck is this sh I love that. Okay, we're gonna have to... We're gonna need better... Holy shit. That evening, the witnesses gathered to discuss what was to be done. United States laws were not applicable west of the Continental Divide, in what was then Mexican territory, Hey, international, like not waters, but uh, hey, international lands, baby. It's a dog eat dog world out there, right? You might get shivved if you touch my ox, okay? Brother, that's the worst. That's what you got a problem with. Right, you touch, you touch my wife slash sister or my ox, I'm gonna plunge my knife right into you. Buddy boy. 
Yeah, what's going to happen? United States laws were not applicable west of the Continental Divide, in what was then Mexican territory, and wagon trains often dispensed their own justice. <laughs> but George Donner, the party's leader, was a full day ahead of the main wagon train with his family. Snyder had been seen to hit James Reed, and some claimed he had also hit Margaret Reed, but Snyder had been popular and Reed was not. Kiesberg <laughs> suggested that Reed should be hanged, but an eventual compromise allowed him to leave the camp without his family, who were to be taken care of by the others. Reed departed alone the next morning, unarmed, but his stepdaughter Virginia rode ahead and secretly provided him with a rifle and food. Disintegration. The trials. Oh shit, here we go, baby. Like, I love that. But a stepdaughter Virginia wrote wrote ahead. Stepdaughter. I'm just saying Wild West shit, nah. Maybe there's a little Maybe there's a little bit of weird shit with it. I'm now I'm now considering like Reed as like the ultimate evil person. Okay, in my story, Reed Reed was fooling around with his stepdaughter or something like that. Alright, just to build up the story of this disintegration. The trials that the Donner Party had so far endured resulted in splintered groups, each looking out for themselves and distrustful of the others. Mm -hmm. Grass was becoming scarce, and the animals were steadily weakening. To relieve the animals' load, everyone was expected to walk. Kiesberg ejected Hardcoop from his wagon, telling the elderly man that he had to walk or die. A few oh. days later, Hardcoop sat next to a stream, his feet so swollen they had split open, he was not seen again. Oh, hard coop. No, a few days later, hard coop sat next. Let's see an older man, hard coop rolled with them. Oh, he was just like, oh, he was hanging out with, with my gay German dudes. Oh, Spitzer. Wait a minute. Was, was Spitzer the one that stabbed him? Two young single men named Spitzer and Rock. Wait, 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 wait. Two young single men named. Okay, wait, fuck, 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 fuck. I'm looking at spoiler shit. Damn it. Wait, fuck. Oh my gosh. Hold up. A few days later, our group sat next to the stream and his feet so swollen. Holy shit. My dude's feet split open. Ah. William Eddy pleaded with the others to find him, but they all refused, swearing they would waste no more resources on a man who was almost 70 years. Oh. Oh, I just got done watching like Squid Games and dude, I'm a sucker for like helpless old people helpless old people like helpless people in general oh my gosh just <clears throat> that makes me a little bit sad <laughs> oh no meanwhile reed caught up with the donners and proceeded with one of his teamsters walter heron the two shared a horse and were able to cover 25 40 <laughs> miles 40 64 kilometers per day <laughs> reed just like up, up, dum, 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 dum. It's like, oh, Reed, what's up? Uh, hello. <clears throat> hello, Donna family. I was like, hey, what what happened to you? Yeah, you decided to, huh? Decided to get ahead of us, huh? You little, you little trickster, huh? Just like, ah, oh, yeah, mm -mm. right. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's like, what happened to your party? Well, um, I, no, no reason. I just decided to hang out with you all. <laughs> ah. Oh, man. Ah, sorry. I fucking. Let's do a little bit of a, uh, you know, I don't want to show off, but, you know, I was practicing the fucking, the arm skills on uh, the Nintendo. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm doing a little bit of boxing and stuff like that. I'm doing a show off. Uh -huh. But yeah, let's get into more of these people almost killing each other. The rest of the party rejoined the Donners, 
but their hardship continued. Native Americans chased away all of Graves' horses, and another wagon was left behind. With grass in short supply, the cattle spread out more, which allowed the Paiutes to steal 18 more during one evening. Oh Several my God. mornings later, they shot another 21. So far, the company had lost nearly 100 oxen and cattle, and their rations were almost completely depleted. With nearly all his cattle gone, Wolfinger stopped at the Humboldt sink to cash. Ferry, his wagon, Reinhardt and Spitzer stayed behind to help. They returned without him, reporting they had been attacked by peyotes and he had been killed. One more stretch of desert lay ahead. The Eddie. Wait, 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 what? Wolfinger stopped. Stayed behind to help. Yo. Nah. Reinhardt and Spitzer, nah. They killed him. Dude, Reinhardt and Spitzer, they don't fuck around. My little German couple over here. Nah, they totally murdered him. They totally murdered him. Return reported. They were uh, they were attacked by um what They were, returned what were they without him? him, reporting they had been attacked by peyotes and peyotes. And he had been killed. Get the fuck out of here. One more stretch of desert lay ahead. The Eddie's oxen had been killed by Native Americans and they were forced to abandon their wagon. The family had eaten all their stores, but the other families refused to assist their children. The Eddie's were forced to walk, carrying their children and miserable with thirst. Margaret Reed and her children were also now without a wagon. But the desert soon came to an end, and the party found the Truckee River in beautiful lush country. Oh, 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 a little bit of a... Oh, yeah, a little time to rest. <laughs> can you all see this? I hope, like, I hope you can. Like, like I hope you're all able to uh, read this along with me. Holy shit. That's crazy. Like, they get past all this. And so, so far, so far, one dude gets stabbed. And the one dude dies of old age, and like a couple of people die of uh, tuber tuberculosis, right? Holy shit. Tru uh, Truckee River. That looks very pretty. So, okay, where is the party at right now? Humboldt. Holy shit, they're right there. You see that? Right? Is that... Truckee Lake, uh, Lake Tahoe, Truckee. They are so close. But they have to get past this mountain. Yo, students. I don't know. I know, yes, it has like an ending and we know what happens, but still like you know, you get into it. Have a little bit of fun. Oh, shit. Okay. They had little time to rest. How difficult was that? Just to leave. Like, you get, like, this beautiful little lush garden in areas. I guess, like, because you're going to a, to a city? Maybe? <sighs> I don't know. No idea. They had little time to rest. The company pressed on to cross the Sierra Nevada before the snows came. Stanton, one of the two men who had left a month earlier to seek assistance in California, found the company, and he brought mules, food, and two Miwak Native Americans named Luis and Salvador. Hey, all right, cool. So, he cab back. He also brought news that Reed and Heron, although haggard and starving, had succeeded in reaching Sutter's Fort in California. By this point, according to Rarick, to the bedraggled, half-starved members of the Donner Party, it must have seemed that the worst of their problems had passed. They had already endured more than many emigrants ever did. Look at it. High pass above Truckee Lake. 7,000 foot. Nah. This is where you go to die. Snow bound. Snow bound. Donna Pass. 
Faced with one last push over mountains that were described as much worse than the Wasatch, the ragtag company had to decide whether to forge ahead or rest their cattle. It was October 20th and they had been told the pass would not be snowed in until the middle of November. William Pike was killed when a gun being loaded by William Foster was discharged negligently. An event that seemed to make the decision for them, family by family, <laughs> they resumed their journey. <laughs> no. <laughs> was discharged neg negligently an event that seemed to make the decision for <laughs> oh no no you tell me <laughs> <laughs> William Foster you son of a bitch damn a gun being loaded <laughs> hey is it loaded <laughs> What do you mean? What happened to this? Oh, no. <laughs> they were like, do you think we would be able to survive? I mean, I think we're pretty good. Hey, William, can you hand me my gun? Yeah, sure. Here it is. Bow. <laughs> it's like, oh, we got to go. We got to go now. That's funny shit. <laughs> Let's do it. First the Breens, then the Keysbergs, Stanton with the Reeds, Graves, and the Murphys. The Donners waited and traveled last. After a few miles of rough terrain, an axle broke on one of their wagons. Jacob and George went Damn. into the woods to fashion a replacement. George Donner sliced his hand open while chiseling the wood but it seemed a superficial wound. Snow yeah. began to fall. The Breens made it up the massive, nearly vertical slope 1,000 feet, 300 meters, to Truckee Lake, now known as Donner Lake, 3 miles, 4.8 kilometers, from the summit, and camped near a cabin that had been built two years earlier by another group of pioneers. Oh, so, okay, this is... Oh, jeez. Hello. Hi. So this is this bad boy. Someone Minecraft. Up their spot. Nice little spawn point. Dude, fuck that. Yeah, I would chill. Chillax. And just, like... Like, don't force it. Like, just survive the winter? Eh, I guess you'd maybe have to hunt. But with a big enough party, I think you'd be able to hunt through that. At least, like, survive jerky. You know, a couple people die. That's fine. Oh, gosh. The Eddies and Keysbergs joined the Breens, attempting to make it over the pass, but they found five, ten foot, one point five, 3.0 meters snow drifts, and were no. unable to find the trail. They turned back for Truckee Lake and within a day all the families were camped there except for the Donners, who were 5 miles, 8.0 kilometers, half a day's journey, below them. On the evening of November 4th, it began to snow again. Map showing the Truckee Lake and Alder Creek. So, the Donner camp, they're hitting up that nice little river, Graves Reeds Cabin, Brains cabin, Murphy cabin. Why, like, set yourself apart like that? That's stupid. Cold Stream Pass, Roller Pass, Cold Creek. You just, like, hated your neighbors that much, I guess? Okay. Let's do it. Winter Camp. 60 members and associates of the Breen, Graves, Reed, Murphy, Keysburg, and Eddie families set up for the winter at Truckee Lake. Three widely separated cabins of pine logs served as their homes, with dirt floors and poorly constructed flat roofs that leaked when it rained. The Breens occupied one cabin, the Eddies and the Murphys another, and the Reeds and the Graves the third. Keysburg built a lean-to for his family against the side of the Breen cabin. The families used canvas or ox hide to patch the faulty roofs. The cabins had no windows or doors, only large holes to allow entry. Of the 60 at Truckee Lake, 19 were men over 18, 12 were women, and 29 were children, 6 of whom were toddlers or younger. Farther Holy down the trail, shit. close to all the creek, 
the Donna family's hastily constructed tents to house 21 people, including Mrs. Wolfinger, her child, and the Donna's drivers, six men, three women, and 12 children in all. It began to snow again on the evening of November 4, the beginning of a storm that lasted eight days. Fuck. So these big ass cabins. What did these cabins look like? Like, what did wagon, wagon train cabin? Cabins look like. No, 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 no. I guess like. Um. Uh, cabins. Cabins during. A wagon train. No, I'm like I'm trying to like search because I really want to know like the living spaces. I want to visualize it. Like, do they have a link to? Stuart uh, page. Okay. Okay. 76. Do I gotta go? Let's see here. Further reading references. It's just Stuart. So, okay. The branch. Okay. Okay. Citation. They just have Stuart. I like Stuart. Like, Stuart, can you please tell me, like, what is Stuart doing here? It's like a whole book. Blazing Dixon. Ah, Stuart George, ordeal by hunger. The story that I'm going to Party. Okay. Supplement edition, 19... 98. Okay, so Stuart, you're just... Alright. Cool, cool, cool. Um, then... Let's just do 1840. More stories. Oh my gosh, I'm not finding anything. I want to know what cabins look like. And I'm not like really finding like the specific ones. Because I we, we see that, like we see it in there. For camp. And again, like, let's see here. Let's get back to it. Winter camps. Ooh. Winter camps in 1840 America. Maybe like that can like shed some light. Oh my gosh. Copy image. Oh, wow. Is that what they... I mean, this is probably the closest we're going to get. But this. Look at my dude. It's like a... I guess like it's like a pick in like the Civil War. So when they were talking about the hole... And then like that hole there, maybe... Like the hastily made this looks like very much run down which i mean that's understandable but like shapley made the winter's coming through boots oh oh i can feel the cold i can feel the cold getting to me all right that is blah all right let's get back to it A storm that lasted for eight days. By the time the party made camp, very little food remained from the supplies that Stanton had brought back from Sutter's fort. The oxen began to die, and their carcasses were frozen and stacked. Well, hey, at least you got frozen meat. Well, you gotta take what you can get there, I guess. 
All right, let's... Truckee Lake was not yet frozen, but the pioneers were unfamiliar with catching lake trout. Eddie, the most experienced hunter, killed a bear, but had little luck after that. The Reed and oh. Eddie families had lost almost everything. Margaret Reed promised to pay double when they got to California for the use of three oxen from the Graves and Breen families. Graves charged Eddie $1.25 normally the cost of two healthy oxen for the carcass of an ox that had starved to death. Desperation grew in camp and some reason that individuals might succeed in navigating the pass where the wagons could not. In small groups they made several attempts, but each time returned defeated. Another severe storm, lasting more than a week, covered the area so deeply that the cattle and horses their only remaining food died and were lost in the snow. Patrick Breen began keeping a diary on November 20th. He concerned himself primarily with the weather marking the storms and how much snow had fallen, but gradually began to include references to God and religion in his in his entries. God doesn't want us here. <laughs> hey man, how you doing? Like we were just like we just wanted to set up we just wanted to know if you wanted to have some of uh Nigel's uh horse jerky and stuff. You look pretty parched and stuff. God never wanted us here. He just wanted us to witness his nature and to die in it. All right, now, um, we're, the jerky's gonna be over there if you're gonna, <laughs> my dude's referencing God. We're in God's land now. <laughs> Life at Truckee Lake was miserable. The cabins were cramped and filthy, and it snowed so much that people were unable to go outdoors for days. Diets soon consisted of ox hide, strips of which were boiled to make a disagreeable glue like jelly. Ox and horse bones were boiled repeatedly to make soup, and they became so brittle that they would crumble upon chewing. Sometimes they were softened by being charred and eaten. Bit by bit, the Murphy children picked apart the ox hide rug that lay in front of their fireplace, roasted it in the fire, and ate it. Uh Holy shit. After the departure of the snowshoe pop You got my kid eating a rug. I ah, oh, I couldn't like... I get a little cranky when I'm, when I don't have breakfast. <laughs> These kids. These kids are just like, I'm hungry. Eat my belt. You little shit. I can't even beat you with it because I'm so hungry. After the departure of the snowshoe party, two thirds of the migrants at Truckee Lake were children. Mrs. Graves was in charge of eight, and Levine, oh, Murphy, and that. Eleanor Eddie together took care of nine. Migrants caught and ate mice that strayed into their cabins. Many of the people at Truckee Lake were soon weakened and spent most of their time in bed. Occasionally one would be able to make the full day trek to see the Donners. News came that Jacob Donner and three hired men had died. One of them, Joseph Freinhardt, confessed on his deathbed that he had murdered Wolfinger. George Donner's hand had become infected, which left- <gasps> you! Oh, shit! <gasps> Fucking COVID! And... Holy shit, they did murder him! That is fucking wild. Holy shit. I... Wow. That is some wild shit. Oh no! Oh, on his deathbed, my boy. Uh, my German gay man. George Donner's hand had become infected, which left four men to work at the Donner camp. Margaret Reed had managed to save enough food for a Christmas pot of soup, to the delight of her children. Aww. But by January they were facing starvation and considered eating the ox hides that served as their roof. Margaret Reed Virginia, Milt Elliot, and the servant girl Eliza Williams attempted to walk out, reasoning that it would be better to try to bring food back than sit and watch the children starve. They were gone for four days in the snow before they had to turn back. Their cabin was now uninhabitable. The ox hide roof served as their food supply, and the family moved in with the Breens. The servants went to live with other families. One day, the graves came by to collect on the debt owed by the reeds and took the ox hides. All that the family had to eat. The forlorn. Oh my god. 
The graves, no. Why do you do this? The forlorn hope. The mountain party at Truckee Lake began to fail. Spitz had died, then Bayliss Williams, a driver for the Reeds, also died, more Damn. from malnutrition than starvation. Franklin Graves fashioned 14 pairs of snowshoes out of oxbows and hide. On December 16th, a party of 17 men, women, and children set out on foot in an attempt to cross the mountain pass. As evidence of how grim their choices were, four of the men were fathers, three of the women, who were mothers, gave their young children to other women. They packed lightly, taking what had become six days' rations, a rifle, a blanket each, a hatchet, and some pistols, hoping to make their way to Bear Valley. Historian Charles McGlashan later called this snowshoe party the Forlorn Hope. Two of those without snowshoes, Charles Berger and 10-year-old William Murphy, turned back early on. Other yeah. members of the party fashioned a pair of snowshoes for 12-year-old Lemuel Murphy on the first evening from one of the pack saddles that they were carrying. The snowshoes proved to be awkward but effective on the arduous climb. The members of the party were neither well-nourished nor accustomed to camping in snow 12 feet, 3.7 meters, deep and, by the third day, most were snow blind. Like, snow blind? Photo photocaratitis or ultraviolet is a painful eye condition caused by exposure of insignificant in exposure of insufficiently protected eyes to the ultraviolet UV rays from me. Oh, because of like the sun bouncing off the snow and hitting it. Wow. On the sixth day, Eddie discovered his wife had hidden a half pound of bear meat in his pack. The group, <gasps> no. the group set out again the morning of December 21st. Stanton had been straggling for several days, and he remained behind, saying he would follow shortly. His remains were found in that location the following year. Oh. Damn it. It's okay, I just... I'm just a little tired, that's all. Please, just go on. I'm just a little tired. The group became lost and confused. After two more days without food, Patrick Dolan proposed one of them should volunteer to die in order to feed the others. Patrick! My dude! One of us should volunteer to die. Not me, not me though, not me. I'm, I'm just suggesting this, okay? Like, I'm... I'm kind of voting dead. What? Yeah, I mean, I, dude, you look at thick. Mm. <laughs> Some suggest, oh, fuck me. Two should volunteer to die. Some, Some suggest suggested a duel, while another account describes an attempt to create a lottery to choose a member to sacrifice. Holy shit. No. Like, I'm going with the duel. No, that's just gonna cause more exhaustion. You're gonna need more people. Unless you just like use as the group, you just like fuck up that one person. Huh? Two meals. Eddie suggested that they keep moving until someone simply fell, but a blizzard forced the group to halt. Antonio, the animal handler, was the first to die. No. Franklin Graves was the next casualty. As the blizzard progressed, Patrick Dolan began to rant deliriously, stripped off his clothes, and ran into the woods. He returned shortly afterwards and died a few hours later. Not long after, possibly because Murphy was near to death, some of the group began to eat flesh from Dolan's body. Lemuel's sister tried to feed some to her brother, but he died shortly afterwards. Eddie, Salvador, and Luis refused to eat. The next oh, come morning, on. the group stripped the muscle and organs from the bodies of Antonio, Dolan, Graves, and Murphy. <gasps> they dried them to store for the days ahead, taking care to ensure nobody would have to eat his or her relatives. Honey, oh my god, you're back. Thank you. Oh my goodness, you You look great. Oh my gosh, did you find food? Just like Yeah. Mm-mm. Didn't care to ensure nobody would have eaten. They dried them to store for the days ahead, taking care to ensure nobody would have to eat his or her relatives. You know you were already banging them, so you might as well eat them. After three days rest, they set off again, searching for the trail. Eddie eventually succumbed to his hunger and ate human flesh. 
but that was soon gone. They began taking apart their snowshoes to eat the oxhide webbing and discussed killing Luis and Salvador for food, <laughs> before Eddie warned the two men and they quietly left. Jay Fostick died during the night, leaving only seven members of the party. Eddie and Mary Graves left to hunt, but when they returned with deer meat, Fostick's body had already been cut apart for food. After several more days 25 since they had left Truckee Lake they came across Salvador and Luis, who had not eaten for about nine days and were close to death. William Foster shot the bear, believing their flesh was the rest of the group's last hope of avoiding imminent death from starvation. Not more than a few days later, the group stumbled into a Native American settlement looking so deteriorated that the camp's inhabitants initially fled. The Native Americans gave them what they had to eat, acorns, grass, and pine nuts. After a few days, Eddie continued on with the help of tribe members to a ranch in a small farming community at the edge of the Sacramento Valley. A hurriedly assembled rescue party found the other six survivors on January 17th. Their journey from Truckee Lake had taken 33 days. Holy shit. And like, what was it? Like, was there like an original amount? Began to fail, Spitcher died. 17 men. 17 men, women, and children set out on foot to attempt to cross the mountain pass. The evidence of how grim their choices were, four of the men were fathers, three of them women, who were mothers, gave their children to the other women. They packed lightly and became and taken what had become six days rations. Holy shit. Now it's time to go out there and rescue them. Six survivors. So seven people survived it. Took took a whole month. Rescue. Reed attempts a rescue. James F. Reed made it out of the Sierra Nevada to Rancho Johnson in late October. He was safe and recovering at Sutter's Fort, but each day he... Of course, fucking James, James fuck Reed made it out. Of course he did. He abandoned his whole place. That jackass. He was safe and recovering at Sutter's Fort, but each day he became more concerned for the fate of his family oh and friends. My God. He pleaded with Colonel John C. Fremont to gather a team of men to cross the pass and help the company. In return, Reed promised to join Fremont's forces and fight in the Mexican-American War. He was joined by McCutcheon, who had been unable to return with Stanton, as well as some members of the Harlan Young Party. The Harlan Young wagon train had arrived at Sutter's Fort on October 8th the last to make it over the Sierra Nevada that season. The party of roughly 30 horses and a dozen men carried food supplies, and expected to find the Donner Party on the western side of the mountain, along the Bear River below the steep approach to Emigrant Gap, perhaps starving but alive. When they arrived in the river valley, they found only a pioneer couple, migrants who had been separated from their company who were near starvation. Two guides deserted Reed and McCutcheon with some of their horses, but they pressed on farther up the valley to Uber Bottoms, walking the last mile on foot. Reed and McCutcheon stood looking up at Emigrant Gap, only 12 miles, 19 kilometers, from the top, blocked by snow, possibly on the same day the Breens attempted to lead one last effort to crest the pass from the east. Despondent, they turned back to Sutter's Fort. If you first don't succeed, try, try again, right? First relief. Much of the military in California were engaged in the Mexican-American War, and with them the able-bodied men. For example, Colonel Fremont's personnel were occupied at that precise time in capturing Santa Barbara. Throughout the region, roads were blocked, communications compromised and supplies unavailable. Only three men responded to a call for volunteers to rescue the Donna party. Reed was laid over in San Jose until February because of regional uprisings and general confusion. He spent that time speaking with other pioneers and acquaintances. The people of San Jose responded by creating a petition to appeal to the U.S. Navy to assist the people at Truckee Lake. Two local newspapers reported that members of the Snowshoe Party had resorted to cannibalism, which helped to foster sympathy for those who were still trapped. Residents of Yerba Buena, many of them recent migrants, raised $1,300, $36,100 in 2020, and organized oh, relief efforts to build two camps to supply a rescue party for the refugees. Oh damn, fucking Patreon! 
Coming up, coming up together. Holy shit. A rescue party including William Meddy started on February 4th from the Sacramento Valley. Rain and a swollen river forced several delays. Eddie stationed himself at Bear Valley, while the others made steady progress through the snow and storms to cross the pass to Truckee Lake, caching their food at stations along the way so they did not have to carry it all. Three of the rescue party turned back, but seven forged on. Like, Eddie. William Eddie. Holy shit. Like, this guy now... Again, right? A rescue party including Billy Meddy was 28. He was one of the um, people, right? This never pleaded for others to find him, but they all refused. Yeah, William Meddy's the good guy. Right? I would I would like to say so. William Eddie pleaded with Eddie's Arkansas has been killed by Native Americans, Eddie was forced to walk, carrying their children miserable oh, thirst. And again, Eddie was um, remarried and started family in California. He attempted to fall through on his promise to murder. Oh my God, what the fuck is this? Fuck me, that's a spoiler, damn it. We didn't, oh my God, okay, hold up. So, okay, 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 okay. He was a part of Levin's two married uh, daughters and their families had come along. Sarah Marie Foster, her husband, Sarah, her husband, uh, William, and their daughters. One, a carriage maker from Illinois brought his wife, Eleanor, and their two children, James and Margaret. My dude was just a simple carriage maker. So, okay, 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 okay. Winter camp, winter camp. I'm just like trying to like. Fuck me. Of course, like I would spoil certain things with that. Ugh. Forlorn hope. Died in route, turned back before reaching past estimated age. Dead, 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 dead. So Sarah, Sarah Foster, William Foster, Marianne Graves, Amanda, Harriet Pike. Wow, so... Oh, 12-year-old died. Hey, fucking the youngster has made it through besides Louise. <sighs> Boy, William H. Eddie, you seem pretty cool. Kind of have like a weird hairstyle going, stuff like that. My boy Eddie decided like, nah, I'm going back. Um, settlement, rescue, first relief throughout. Okay, two local newspapers reported camp, and then rescue party. William Eddie started. Including William Eddy started on February 4th, Sacramento. Okay. All right, cool. On February 18th, the seven man rescue party scaled Fremont Pass, now Donner Pass, as they neared where Eddie told them the cabins would be. They began to shout. Mrs. Murphy appeared from a hole in the snow, stared at them, and asked, Are you men from California, or do you come from heaven? The relief party doled out food in small portions, concerned that it might kill them if the emaciated migrants over it. All the right. cabins were buried in snow. Sodden ox hide roofs had begun to rot and the smell was overpowering. Thirteen oh people at the camps were dead, and their bodies had been loosely buried in snow near the cabin roofs. Some of the migrants seemed emotionally unstable. Three of the rescue party trekked to the Donners and brought back four gaunt children and three adults. Leanna Donner had particular difficulty walking up the steep incline from Alder Creek to Truckee Lake, later writing Damn. such pain and misery as I endured that day is beyond description. George Donner's arm was so gangrenous he could not move. 23 oh. people were chosen to go with the rescue party, leaving 21 in the cabins at Truckee Lake and 12 at Alder Creek. The rescuers concealed the fate of the snowshoe party, informing the rescued migrants only that they did not return because they were frostbitten. 
Patty and Tommy Reed were soon too weak to cross the snowdrifts, and no one was strong enough to carry them. Margaret Reed faced the agonizing predicament of accompanying her two older children to Bear Valley and watching her two frailest be taken back to Truckee Lake without a parent. She made rescuer Aquila Glover swear on his honor as a mason that he would return for her children. Patty Reed told her, Well, mother, if you never see me again, do the best you can. Upon their return to the lake, the Breens flatly refused them entry to their cabin but, after Glover left more food, the children were grudgingly admitted. The rescue party was dismayed to find that the first cash station had been broken into by animals, leaving them without food for four days. Oh after struggling God. on the walk over the pass, John Denton slipped into a coma and died. Ada <laughs> Keesberg died soon afterwards, her mother was inconsolable, refusing to let the child's body go. After several days more travel through difficult country, the rescuers grew very concerned that the children would not survive. Some of them mm. ate the buckskin fringe from one of the rescuers' pants, and the shoelaces of another, to the relief party's surprise. On their way down from the mountains, they met the next rescue party, which included James Reed. Upon hearing his voice, Margaret sank into the snow, overwhelmed. After these rescued migrants made it safely into Bear Valley, William Hook, Jacob Donner's stepson, broke into food stores and fatally gorged himself. The Aww. others continued to Sutter's Fort, where Virginia Reed wrote, I really thought I had stepped over into paradise. How do you... That's fucked. I mean, of course, like, I like I can, like, be, like, be the guy over the head for it, but it's just like, you got there, dude. Fucking, you got there, and you fucking gorged yourself. Bro. Last level, and you tanked it. The others continued to Sutter's Fort, where Virginia Reed wrote, I really thought I had stepped over into paradise. She was amused to note one of the young men asked her to marry him, although she was only 12 years old and recovering from starvation, but she turned him down. Yeah, thank you. Holy shit. <laughs> oh my god, my dude. <laughs> That's just... <laughs> Fuck me, that is just fuck. Oh my gosh, that is just, that's so. <laughs> my dude was just like, hey, pretty lady, I really like, I really like your thin, frail, small frame. God. Second relief. Around the time the first relief party was being organized, nearby California settler and patriarch George C. Yount had likely previously heard of the plight of the Donna Party and had distressing dreams of a struggling group of starving pioneers in deep snow. Yount, Mariano Guadalupe Vallejo and others then raised $500 to send out another rescue party. On March 1st, the second relief party arrived at Truckee Lake. These rescuers included veteran mountain men, most notably John Turner, who accompanied the return of Reed and McCutcheon. Reed was reunited with his daughter Patty and his weakened son Tommy. An inspection of the Breen cabin found its occupants relatively well, but the Murphy cabin, according to author George Stewart, passed the limits of description and almost of imagination. Lavina Murphy was okay. caring for her eight-year-old son Simon and the two young children of William Eddy and Foster. She had deteriorated mentally and was nearly blind. The children oh. were listless and had not been cleaned in days. Louis Kiesberg had moved into the cabin and could barely move due to an injured leg. No one at Truckee Lake had died during the interim between the departure of the first and the arrival of the second relief party. Wow. Patrick Breen documented a disturbing visit in the last week of February from Mrs. Murphy, who said her family was considering eating Milt Elliot. Reed and McCutcheon found Elliot's mutilated body. The Alder Creek camp fared no better. The first two members of the relief party to reach it saw Trudeau. Oh, so they did eat him. Wait. Who said her family was considering eating Mill Elliot and then, yeah. The Alder Creek camp fared no better. The first two members of the relief party to reach it saw Trudeau carrying a human leg. When they made their presence known, oh. he threw it into a hole in the snow that contained the mostly dismembered body of Jacob Donner. Inside the tent, Elizabeth Donner refused to eat, although her children were being nourished by their father's organs. The rescuers discovered three other bodies had already been consumed. In the other tent, Tamsin Donner was well, but George was very ill because the infection had reached his shoulder. Holy shit. I don't know what you're talking about. He was a provider. Till the day past his death, he was providing for his family. How, uh, as a, like, 
a mother, you watch your own kids eat your husband. He died and your kids were like, mom, I'm hungry. Fuck. That is some fucked shit. The second relief evacuated 17 migrants from Truckee Lake, only three of whom were adults. Cool. Both the Breen and Graves families prepared to go. Only five people remained at Truckee Lake, Keysburg, Mrs. Murphy and her son Simon, and the young Eddie and foster children. Tamsin Donnie elected to stay with her ailing husband after Reed informed her that a third relief party would arrive soon. Mrs. Donner kept her daughters Eliza Georgia, and Francis with her. The walk back to Bear Valley was very slow. At one point, Reed sent two men ahead to retrieve the first cache of food, expecting the third relief, a small party led by Sailor Mee Woodworth, to come at any moment. A violent blizzard arose after they oh. scaled the pass. Five-year-old Isaac Donner froze to death and Reed nearly died. Mary Donna's feet were badly burned because they were so frostbitten that she did not realize she was sleeping with them in the fire. When the storm oh, passed, shit. the Breen and Graves families were too apathetic and exhausted to get up and move, not having eaten for days. The oh. relief party had no choice but to leave without them. The site where the Breens and Graves had been left became known as Starved Camp. Margaret Breen reportedly took the initiative to try to keep the members of the camp alive after the others departed down the mountain. Soon, however, Elizabeth Graves and her son Franklin perished before the next rescue party could reach them, uh. and the party resorted to eating flesh off the dead bodies in order uh. to survive. Three members of the relief party stayed to help those remaining at the camps, Charles Stone at Truckee Lake, Charles Cady and Nicholas Clark at Alder Creek. While Clark was out hunting, Stone traveled to Alder Creek and made plans with Cady to return to California. According to Stewart, Tams and Don arranged for them to take her daughters Eliza Georgia, and Francis with them, perhaps for $500 cash. Stone and Cady took the three girls to Truckee Lake, but left them at a cabin with Keysburg and Lavina Murphy when they started for Bear Valley. Cady recalled later, that after two days on the trail they noted and passed starved camp, but they did not stop to help in any way. They overtook Reed and the others within days. Several oh. days later at the Alder Creek camp, Clark and Trudeau agreed to leave for California together. When they reached Truckee Lake and discovered the Donner girls still there they returned to Alder Creek to inform Tams and Donner. William Foster and William Meddy, survivors of the Snowshoe Party, started from Bear Valley to intercept Reed, taking with them a man named John Stark. After a day, they mm -hmm. met Reed helping his children struggle on toward Bear Valley, all frostbitten and bleeding but alive. Desperate to oh, rescue their shit. own children, Foster and Eddie persuaded four men, with pleading and money, to go to Truckee Lake with them. During their journey they found the eleven survivors at Starved Camp, huddled oh, around a fire that had sunk shit. into a pit. The relief party split, with Foster, Eddie, and two others headed toward Truckee Lake. Two of the rescuers, hoping to save some of the survivors, each took a child and headed back to Bear Valley. John cool. Stark refused to leave the others. He picked up two children and all the provisions and assisted the remaining Breens and Graves to safety, sometimes advancing the children down the trail piecemeal, putting them down and then going back to carry the other debilitated children. Third oh relief, Foster and Eddie finally arrived at Truckee Lake on March 14th where they found their children dead. Keysburg told oh. Eddie that he had eaten the remains of Eddie's son. Eddie swore to murder Keysburg if they ever met in California. George Donner and one of Jacob Donner's children were still alive at Alder Creek. Tams- Wait, wait, wait. Keysburg told Eddie that he had eaten the remains of Eddie's son. Holy shit. Oh my God! Where? Like, okay, wait, 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 wait. I, I need to confirm who was, and again, who was Keysburg? Again, Keysburg told Daddy that he had eaten the. This fucking like, <laughs> I gotta figure out who's Kingsburg. Keysburg. Okay, wait, wait. but left them at the cabin with Keysburg, and where they started to prepare out. Only five people remained. He sent her son and the young Eddie and Foster and the children. Second relief evacuated 17 migrants, both. So only five people remained at Truckee Lake. Okay, 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 okay. And then so the members of the relief party stayed. Delta was remaining at the camp. At the Truckee Lake, Clark and Elder Creek. Okay, while well, Clark was out hunting, so in trouble. 
Grant made plans to return to California, according to Stuart Timsey. Arranged, uh, arra uh, Tim uh, Timson uh, Donner arranged for them to take their daughter Elsie. Stone and Caddy took their three girls to Truck Lake, but left them uh, at the cabin with Keysburg and leaving Murphy when they started. Wow, so my dude just took the money and ran. So I'm like rereading this so I can understand it. There's like so much shit that's happening. Caddy recalled later. Uh, that after two days on the trail, they noted past starved camped with it. Oh, wow, and they just fucking left them. They were took read. This is how like I'm understanding it. This is how I'm understanding it. Two days desperate to rescue him. During their journey, they found the 11 survivors at starved camp huddled around the fire. The relief pit split. The relief party split with Foster, Eddie, and two others headed towards uh, Truckee Lake. Two of the rescuers hoping to save some of the survivors each took a child heading back to Bear Valley. John Stark refused to leave others. He picked up. Okay. And then we're here. Third relief. Foster and Eddie finally arrived at Truckee Lake on March 14th, where they found their children dead. Keysburg told Eddie that he had eaten the remains of Eddie's son. Eddie swore to murder Keysburg if they ever met in California. George Donner and one of Jacob Donner's children were still alive at Alder Creek. Tamsin wow. Donner had just arrived at the Murphy cabin to see to her daughters. She could have walked out alone but chose to return to her husband, even though she was informed that no other relief party was likely to be coming soon. Holy Foster and Eddie shit. and the rest of the third relief left with the Donner girls, young Simon Murphy, Trudeau, and Clark. Lavina Murphy was too weak to leave and Keysburg refused. To so, members of the rest, members rescued by the third party, Mr. Donner. Wow, the Donner kids just pushed through that. Holy shit. And then John Bet, wow, he survived that. And again, who was. Keysburg told Daddy that he had. Sorry, I'm just like, I, I just want to figure out who the hell. Philip built a lean to camp and joined the Breens attempting to make their path. Eddie's the Eddie's and Kingsburg joined the Breens attempting to make a pass over. Fine. <gasps> Kingsburg ejected Harku from the wagon, telling the elder man that he would walk or die. Oh, fuck, Kingsburg. Read Kess. Keysburg, those motherfuckers, he, he fucked up the old guy. Oh no. Oh my gosh. Suggested that Reed should be hanged. Okay. At least he had some kind of good qualities. Okay. 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 Cool. 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 Dude, this is this is amazing. In the worst way, this is amazing. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. So, and what happened to Tamsin? Tamsin Donna had just arrived at the Murphy cabin to see to her daughters. She could have walked out alone, but chose to return to her husband, even though she was informed that no other relief party was likely to be coming soon. Foster and Eddie and the rest of the third relief left. Wait, what? So. I told Eddie I had just arrived at the Murphy cabin to see her daughters, but she could have walked out alone, but chose to return her, chose to return her husband, even though she was informed that no relief party was likely to be coming soon. Oh, shit. Oh, so she chose to stay there for, wow. Foster and Eddie and the rest of the third relief left with the Donner girls. Young Simon Murphy, Trudeau, and Clark. Lavina Murphy was too weak to leave and Keysburg refused. Two more relief parties were mustered to evacuate any adults who might still be alive. Both turned back before getting to Bear Valley, and no further attempts were made. On <gasps> April 10th, almost a month since the third relief had left Truckee Lake, the Alcalde near Sutter's Fort organized a salvage party to recover what they could of the Donner's belongings. These would be sold, with part of the proceeds used to support the orphan Donner children. The salvage uh. party found the Alder Creek tents empty except for the body of George Donner 
who had died only days earlier. On their oh. way back to Truckee Lake, they found Lewis Kiesberg alive. According oh, to him... Yo! Oh, you're gonna fucking die, bitch. You're gonna fucking die, bitch. You're gonna fucking die, bitch. According to him, Mrs. Murphy had died a week after the departure of the third relief. Some weeks later, Tams and Donna had arrived at his cabin on her way over the pass, soaked and visibly upset. Keysberg said he put a blanket around her and told her to start out in the morning, but she died during the night. The salvage party was suspicious of Keysberg's story, and found a pot full of human flesh in the cabin along with George Donna's pistols, jewelry, and $250 in gold. They threatened to lynch Keysberg who confessed that he had cashed $273 of the Donner's money, at Damson's suggestion, so that it could one day benefit her children. Respond. Kingsburg, you're gonna fucking die, my dude. Holy shit. I thought Reed was a piece of shit. I mean, he's also a piece of shit, and he should fucking die. But what was it? Kingsburg? You are a sack of shit. Response. News of the Donner Party's fate was spread eastward by Samuel Brannan, an elder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and a journalist, who ran into the salvage party as they came down from the pass with Keysburg. Accounts of the ordeal first reached New York City in July 1847. Reporting on the event across the U.S. was heavily influenced by the national enthusiasm for westward migration. In some papers, news of the tragedy was buried in small paragraphs, despite the contemporary tendency to sensationalize stories. Several newspapers, including those in California, wrote about the cannibalism in graphic exaggerated detail. In some print accounts, mm. the members of the Donner Party were depicted as heroes and California a paradise worthy of significant sacrifices. Emigration to the West decreased over the following years, but it is likely that yeah. the drop in numbers was caused more by fears over the outcome of the ongoing Mexican-American war than by the cautionary tale of the Donner Party. In 1846, an estimated 1,500 people migrated to California. In 1847, the number dropped to 450 and then to 400 in 1848. The California gold rush spurred a sharp increase, however, and 25,000 people went west in 1849. Ah. Most of the overland migration followed the Carson River, but a few 49ers used the same route as the Donner Party and recorded descriptions about the site. In late June 1847, members of the Mormon battalion under General Stephen Carney buried the human remains, and partially burned two of the cabins. The few who ventured over the pass in the next few years found bones, other artifacts, and the cabin used by the Reed and Graves families. In 1891, a cache of money was found buried by the lake. It had probably been stored by Mrs. Graves, who hastily hid it when she left with the second relief so she could return for it later. Oh, Lansford wow. Hastings oh. received death threats. A migrant who crossed before the Donner Party confronted him about the difficulties <laughs> they had encountered, reporting, of course he could say nothing but that he was very sorry, and that he meant well. So Hastings, you, oh my, Hastings, Reeds, fucking, um, Kisberg, bitches. Survivors. Of the 87 people who entered the Wasatch Mountains, 48 survived. Only the Reed and Breen families remained intact. The children of Jacob Donner, George Donner, and Franklin Graves were orphaned. William Damn. Eddy was alone, most of the Murphy family had died. Only three mules reached California, the remaining animals perished. Most of the Donner Party members' possessions were discarded. I have not wrote to you half the trouble we have had but I have wrote enough to let you know that you don't know what trouble is. But thank God we have all got through and the only family that did not eat human flesh. We have left everything but I don't care for that. We have got through with our lives but don't let this letter dishearten anybody. Never take no cutoffs and hurry along as fast as you can. Virginia read to cousin Mary Keys, May 16th, 1847. Virginia reads. Bleh. Virginia read to cousin Mary Keys, May 16th, 1847. A few of the widowed women remarried within months. Brides were scarce in California. Damn. I mean, I guess that was the way to survive back in the day, honestly. A few of the widowed women remarried within months. Brides were scarce in California. The Reeds settled in San Jose and two of the Donner children lived with them. Reed fared well in the California gold rush and became prosperous. Virginia wrote an extensive letter to her cousin in Illinois about our troubles getting to California, with editorial oversight from her father. 
Journalist Edwin Bryant carried it back in June 1847, and it was printed in its entirety in the Illinois Journal on December 16, uh -huh. 1847, with some editorial alterations. Virginia converted to Catholicism, fulfilling a promise she had made to herself while observing Patrick Breen pray in his cabin. The Murphy survivors lived in Marysville, California. The Breens made their way to San Juan Bautista, California, where they operated an inn. They became the anonymous subjects of J. Ross Brown's story about his severe discomfort upon learning that he was staying with alleged cannibals, printed in Harper's Magazine in 1862. Wow. Many of the survivors encountered similar reactions. George and Tams and Donna's children were taken in by an older couple near Sutter's Fort. Eliza was three years old during the winter of 1846. 1847, the youngest of the Donna children. She published an account of the Donna party in 1911, based on printed accounts and those of her sisters. The Breen's youngest daughter Isabella was a one-year-old during the winter of 1846, 1847 and wow. the last survivor of the Donna party. She died in 1935. The Graves' children lived varied lives. Mary Graves married early, but her first husband was murdered. She cooked <laughs> his killer's food while he was in prison to ensure the condemned man did not starve before his hanging. One of Holy Mary's grandchildren shit. noted she was very serious, Graves once said, I wish I could cry but I cannot. If I could forget the tragedy, perhaps I would know how to cry again. Mary's brother William had several different occupations, a diverse lifestyle, and his nieces thought he was eccentric and irascible. He died in 1907 and was buried in Calistoga. Nancy Graves was nine years old during the winter of 1846, 1847. She refused to acknowledge her involvement even when contacted by historians interested in recording the most accurate versions of the episode. Wow. Nancy reportedly was unable to recover from her role in the cannibalism of her brother and mother. Eddie remarried oh. and started a family in California. He attempted to follow through on his promise to murder Lewis Kiesberg but was dissuaded by James Reed and Edwin Bryant. Um. A year later, Eddie recalled his experiences to J. Quinn Thornton, who wrote the earliest account of the episode, also using Reed's memories of his involvement. Eddie died in Petaluma, California um. on December 24, 1859. Kiesberg brought a defamation suit against several members of the relief party who accused him of murdering Tams and Donna. The court awarded him one dollar in damages, but also made him pay court costs. An 1847 story printed in the California Star described Keysburg's actions in ghoulish terms and his near lynching by the salvage party. It reported that he preferred eating human flesh over the cattle and horses that had become exposed in the spring thaw. Historian Charles McGlashan amassed enough material to indict Keysburg for the murder of Tams and Donna. But after interviewing him he concluded no murder occurred. Eliza Donna Houghton also believed Keysburg to be innocent. As Keysburg grew older, he did not venture outside, for he had become a pariah and was often threatened. He told McGlashan, I often think that the Almighty has singled me out, among all the men on the face of the earth, in order to see how much hardship, suffering, and misery a human being can bear. Legacy. The Donna Party episode. <sighs> Yeah, no, he ate her. Legacy. He totally ate her. The Donna Party episode has served as the basis for numerous works of history, fiction, drama, poetry, and film. The attention directed at the Donna Party is made possible by reliable accounts of what occurred, according to Stewart, and the fact that the cannibalism, although it might almost be called a minor episode, has become in the popular mind the chief fact to be remembered about the Donner Party, for a taboo always allures with as great strength as it rebels. The appeal is the events focused on families and ordinary people, according to Johnson, writing in 1996, instead of on rare individuals, and that the events are a dreadful irony that hopes of prosperity, health, and a new life in California's fertile valleys led many only to misery, hunger, and death on her stony threshold. The site of the cabins became a tourist attraction as early as 1854. In the 1880s, Charles McGlashan began promoting the idea of a monument to mark the site of the Donner Party episode. He helped to acquire the land for a monument, and in June 1918, the statue of a pioneer family, dedicated to the Donner Party, was placed on the spot where the Breen Keysburg cabin was thought to have stood. It was made a California historical landmark in 1934. The state of California created the Donner Memorial State Park in 1927. It originally consisted of 11 acres, 4.5 hectares, surrounding the monument. Twenty years later, the site of the Murphy cabin was purchased and added to the park. In 1962, 
the Emigrant Trail Museum was added to tell the history of westward migration into California. The Murphy Cabin and Donner Monument were established as a National Historic Landmark in 1963. A large rock served as the back end of the fireplace of the Murphy Cabin, and a bronze plaque has been affixed to the rock listing the members of the Donner Party, indicating who survived and who did not. The state of California justifies memorializing the site because the episode was an isolated and tragic incident of American history that has been transformed into a major folk epic. As of 2003, the park is estimated to receive 200,000 visitors a year. Yeah, and from other points of view, it was uh, Native Americans just fucking trolling a bunch of rich people going across the mountains. <laughs> that's, oh man, that's brutal. Mortality. Most historians count 87 members of the party, although Stephen McCurdy in the Western Journal of Medicine includes Sarah Keyes, Margaret Reed's mother, and Luis and Salvador, bringing the number to 90. Five people had already died before the party reached Truckee Lake one from tuberculosis, Halloran, three from trauma, Snyder, Wolfinger, and Pike, and one from exposure. Hardcoop. A further 34 died between December 1846 and April 1847, 25 males and 9 females. Several historians and other authorities have studied the mortalities to determine what factors may affect survival in nutritionally deprived individuals. Of the 15 members of the Snowshoe Party, 8 of the 10 men who set out died, Stanton, Dolan, Graves, Murphy, Antonio, Fostick, Luis, and Salvador, but all five women survived. A professor at the University Ooh, of Washington stated that the Donner Party episode Go is women. a case study of demographically mediated natural selection in action. The deaths at Truckee Lake, <laughs> at Alder Creek, and in the Snowshoe Party were probably caused by a combination of extended malnutrition, overwork, and exposure to cold. Several members became more susceptible to infection due to starvation, such as George Donner, but the three most significant factors in survival were age, sex, and the size of family group that each member traveled with. The survivors were on average 7.5 years younger than those who died. Children aged between 6 and 14 had a much higher survival rate than infants and children under the age of 6, of whom 62.5% died, including the son born to the Keysbergs on the trail, or adults over the age of 35. No, hey, that's a D. That's like a D minus. Like, yeah, it's not the greatest, but hey, it's not a fail. It's not a failure. No adults over the age of 49 survived. Deaths were extremely high among males aged between 20 and 39, at more than 66%. Men have been found to metabolize protein faster, and women do not require as high a caloric intake. Women also store more body fat, which delays the effects of physical degradation caused by starvation and overwork. Men also tend to take on more dangerous tasks, and in this particular instance, the men were required to clear brush and engage in heavy labor before reaching Truckee Lake, adding to their physical debilitation. Yeah. Those traveling with family members had a higher survival rate than bachelor males, possibly because family members more readily shared food with each other. Claims of cannibalism. Although some survivors disputed the accounts of cannibalism, Charles McGlashan, who corresponded with many of the survivors over a 40-year period, documented many recollections that it occurred. Some correspondents were not forthcoming, approaching their participation with shame, but others eventually spoke about it freely. McGlashan in his 1879 book History of the Donner Party declined to include some of the more morbid details such as the suffering of the children and infants before death or how Mrs. Murphy, according to Georgia Donner, gave up, lay down on her bed and faced the wall when the last of the children left in the third relief. He also neglected to mention any cannibalism at Alder Creek. The same year McGlashan's book was published, Georgia Donner wrote to him to clarify some points saying that human flesh was prepared for people in both tents at Alder Creek. But to her recollection, mm. she was four years old during the winter of 1846. 1847, it was given only to the youngest children, father was crying and did not look at us the entire time, and we little ones felt we could not help it. There was nothing else. She also remembered oh, that Elizabeth shit. Donner, Jacob's wife, announced one morning that she had cooked the arm of Samuel Shoemaker a 25-year-old teamster. Eliza Donner Houghton, in her 1911 account of the ordeal, did not mention any cannibalism at Alder Creek. Archaeological findings at the Alder Creek camp proved inconclusive for evidence of cannibalism. None of the bones tested at the Alder Creek cooking hearth could be identified with certainty as human. According to Rarick, 
only cooked bones would be preserved, and it is unlikely that the Donner Party members would have needed to cook human bones. Eliza Farnham's 1856 account of the Donner Party was based largely on an interview with Margaret Breen. Her version details the ordeals of the Graves and Breen families after James Reed and the Second Relief left them in the snow pit. According to Farnham, seven-year-old Mary Donner suggested to the others that they should eat Isaac Donner, Franklin Graves Jr., and Elizabeth Graves. Because wow. the Donners had already begun eating the others at Alder Creek, including Mary's father Jacob, Margaret Breen insisted that she and her family did not cannibalize the dead, but Kristen Johnson, Ethan Rarick, and Joseph King whose account is sympathetic to the Breen family do not consider it credible that the Breens, who had been without food for nine days, would have been able to survive without eating human flesh. King mm -hmm. suggests Farnham included this in her account independently of Margaret Breen. According to an account published by H.A. Wise in 1847, Jean-Baptiste Trudeau boasted of his own heroism, but also spoke in lurid detail of eating Jacob Donner, and said he had eaten a baby raw. Many years later, Trudeau met Eliza Donner Houghton and denied cannibalizing anyone. He reiterated, Holy shit. And denied can cannibalizing anyone. Motherfucker was joking when was talking about eating a baby raw. Like, yeah, I did that. He reiterated this in an interview with the St. Louis newspaper in 1891, when he was 60 years old. Houghton and the other Donner children were fond of Trudeau, and he of them, despite their circumstances and the fact that he eventually left Tams and Donner alone. Author George Stewart considers Trudeau's accounting to Wise more accurate than what he told Houghton in 1884, and asserted that he deserted the Donners. Kristen Johnson, on the other hand, attributes Trudeau's interview with Wise to be a result of common adolescent desires to be the center of attention and to shock one's elders, when older, he reconsidered his story, so as not to upset Houghton. Historians mm. Joseph King and Jack Steed call Stewart's characterization of Trudeau's actions as desertion extravagant moralism, particularly because all members of the party were forced to make difficult choices. Ethan Rarick echoed this by writing, More than the gleaming heroism or sullied villainy, the Donner Party is a story of hard decisions that were neither heroic nor villainous. Besides, uh... Uh, what was it? Uh, Keysburg. Yeah, besides Keysburg, that son of a bitch. Holy shit. Well, there it is, ladies and gentlemen. That was the tale of the Donner Party. I wonder if we can, like, end it off with a nice little, uh, See, weird history. Oh, that's kind of cool. The Donner Party full movie? Get the fuck out of here. True story of survival. Wow. There's a lot. Uh, Red Division of Donner Party Survivor. It's pretty cool. Okay, let's um let's go right ahead and uh check out what this video is from Weird History. Most people know what happened to the Donner Party, a group of settlers led by George uh Donner and James F. Reed once they reached Elder Creek, California, and Sierra Nevada Mountains. Members of the party resorted to cannibalism and were survived after they became trapped. By a massive snowfall. Let's see what's up. Um, there we go. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Let's check this out. I want to go. Want to play this and see how you actually. Eh. Nah. You know what? I'm not feeling too much on just um pretty. I'm pretty tired on what, what's been going on, actually. But holy shit. I wonder if there's, like... I wonder if there's, like, anything else. Like, if there's, like, any other, like, expert accounts on just, like, going into it. What was this? 
ask historians why was the Donner so on Reddit? I'm looking at a post on Reddit. Why was the Donner Party trapped? Couldn't they just go around the mountains or in between? Couldn't they catch fish or shoot bear? Why couldn't they make fires? I know this is a dumb question, but I'm genuinely interested. I've seen pictures of the pa of the pass it and pass, and it doesn't look too difficult to pass through. Nobody can give me a clear answer. Comments getting. Uh, comments keep getting deleted. If you're educated on this topic in the slightest, please tell me. Let's see, inactive moderator. It's your first time. Okay, was was yeah. Okay, 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 okay. So in response to this, kind of what was the ultimate demise of the Donner Party? Let's go ahead and get a recollection amount of American West European folklore mod emeritus. So somewhat of an expert. All right, let's get kind of their speculation onto this. The Donner Party made a couple of fatal choices that led them into a deadly situation. These were not savvy frontiersmen who knew how to survive in the wilderness. They were emigrants who wanted to go from the settled east to the promise of opportunity in California. They were naive and ignorant in many ways. Their mm. first mistake was to take the infamous Hastings cut off an alternative route in the eastern Great Basin that cost them a lot of time. They had left Missouri late. They were the last group of wagons to head west that spring, and the Hastings cutoff cost the group additional time. The result was that they reached the foot of the Sierra Nevada late in the season. Although a storm was threatening, they decided to risk the ascent, to do otherwise would have meant that they would have needed to winter in the valley on the east side of the Sierra, around the current location of Reno with little to supply their existence until spring. There is mm. no going around the Sierra Nevada, it is a formidable wall of mountains many hundreds of miles long. There are oh, a few high okay. elevation passes which provide the only means across the mountain range. Donner Pass, the current location of Highway 80, is one of the best passes and was and is the most traveled. Despite this, if there are chains or snow tires required in one spot in the US, it is likely to be over Donner. Even today, it is a tough piece of real estate to traverse in the winter. The okay. winter of 1846-47 was particularly bad. The first snowstorm that caught the Donner Party arrived early and dumped a lot of snow. The group could not move their wagons and they could not walk out, so they decided to camp where they were and wait for the snow to melt. Unfortunately, it was just one of those winters when the snow kept coming. Oh. Forage was completely covered, so the animals were certain to die and they provided the last good meals of the refugees. The men tended to die first, studies indicate that they likely had burned more body fat through heavy labor and they were exposed to more of the elements because they were doing the outdoor work. Burning calories while attempting to hunt and erecting primitive shelters. For whatever reason, many men died, leaving mostly women and children. Fishing was a possibility, which they tried, but the Donner Lake fish are best caught from a boat rather than on shore, and the group lacked boats. Hunting was nearly impossible because the group was not prepared to traverse across the snow. So they remained at camp, with campfires, they did, at least, know how to build a fire. There were several attempts to reach the party. A group of Native Americans tried to approach the camp with supplies, but they were seen as threatening and the Donner Party attacked them. People from California oh, made shit. several attempts to get supplies to the group, but they were met with the same challenges of deep snow. It was, simply, a really bad situation. There are several sources on this. In addition to Don Hart, uh, Don, in addition to Don Hart, mm, Hart, Disty, and the others offer an excellent modern analysis of the archaeology of the Donner Party University. Wow, a lot of people mentioned the Hastings cutoff being the problem, but I thought the bigger problem was they chose to use these giant wagons on Conestogan instead of more typical um, prairie shoon schooner and types used for Western migration. The pivotal issue was timing, late departure, the Hastings cutoff's early snowstorm sealed the deal. I haven't delved into the different type of wagons, perhaps. Uh, both of whom have written here with the authority know the answer. How dreadful to hear about the Native Americans attempting to help help being attacked. Yeah. The Fountain Tribes have been terrorizing them and robbing them for weeks. Thank you for being the first, at least, uh, California Native California Native here and thought it sounded prosperous. Yeah. The expanse of the West is difficult to imagine until it is seen and lived. 
I once had a National Park Service official tell me that they were going in to they were going to in Las Vegas and asked if I could drive down the Carson City for a quick meeting. They were shocked to hear that it would take the better part of a day to drive down and then drive back. These were educated employees of the nation's government and they had no idea about the Western Expanse. Prosperitous, yes. But understandable for those who haven't been there. How do people from California know they were uh, there and where were they? There's a number of reasons. First, wagon trails leaving uh, Missouri were not something that could fly under the radar. It was a big ordeal passing over in the Great Plains, Rocky Mountains, Great Bison, Sierra Nevadas. These groups were advertised, hoping to attract more people to move west and helping along the way. Other wagon trains, the military, frontiersmen, some uh, natives would have been well aware of their presence and at the very least communicated with others in the area the donner party was the last wagon train en route that year so many others were expected were expecting them eventually arrive not only that but some of the original members of the train were kicked out from other from another common breed same path but fewer people moving faster all they had to do was backtrack in the spring to find the rest of the Donner Party. Right. If only I had been there in Hingsford, I would have led them east, then they would have gone and you know, I wanted to go west. <laughs> that was kidding. Honestly, it sounds like a series of terrible, avoidable decisions made by complete amateurs. Yeah. Surely they at least knew they uh, having lived in the Midwest, the importance of avoiding traveling in winter, delaying travel from, from morning when starting late to begin with. I get they uh, lost someone, uh, but in that situation, you just don't have time to waste. Where uh, Were they not able to stop, uh, uh, stop in winter near an, an existing settlement or fort? A series of, uh, a series of avoidable events was completed. Well said. <laughs> There were no settlements, Native Americans aside, in the Western Great Bison until 1851. In 1846, they would have needed to find means to survive what would have been bad winter in an unforgiving landscape, even at the base of the Sahara. And they could not know what to expect and could only fear the local Native Americans, who probably would have been very generous, but they didn't know that. Oh... Uh, well said but this story is not grounded on sound thinking and good decisions <laughs> no such thing at the time were they able to stop okay no such thing at the time see attacking natives seems pretty foolish at first the natives perhaps but the party hadn't had great experience with the natives up until that point uh, from petty a stolen shirt to significant some 40 cattle the party had a lot of things stolen from various encounters in nevada given the half of the party did survive protecting the remaining meager supplies okay depending on the and then that yeah that's just person so when the party gets to the Truckee river they are physically exhausted dangerously low in supplies extremely low on morale okay so they tried their best to survive, but by the time the Donner Party was in serious trouble, they already backed into a fair corner. Ever facing repercussions? Not really. He had a successful career as a soldier, lawyer, judge, and postmaster. He died while helping the former Confederates settle in Brazil, having written a new guidebook this time about settling in Brazil. My dude doubled down. Oh, this jackass. He should be noted, although the Donner Party had a hell of a time with it. The Hastings uh, cutoff was used somewhat successfully that same year. Yeah, he like led people through it. So it was just simply the Donner's Party. Wow. It seems to uh, place a lot of blame on Hastings cutoff being ill-suited for the trip and inexperienced. The Hastings cutoff was ill-suited for the trip, but there was no good way to get from seawater tablet. Okay. 
wait, I have more questions about James Reed. So he was kicked out, kicked out of the party. Some folks left with him. He apparently went ahead, made it, and tried to get supplies back, back to the Donner Party, which included his family. So how come his family didn't go with him? You know, who was it that did leave with Reed? How successful were the attempts getting supplies to turn out to be? I'm assuming not very, considering we all know how the story turned out that winter. That's what I, I get from. Uh, that's what I get for trying to gloss over some details, uh, reasonable questions. But early October, it was pretty clear the party's food was going to run out before they got to Sutter's Fort. In September, oh fuck me. Yeah, Brian, I'm gonna need some help here. That's what I get for trying to gloss over some details. <laughs> Reasonable questions. By early October it was pretty clear the party's food was going to run out before they got to Sutter's Fort. In September they had already sent a couple men ahead on horseback to bring back supplies from California. And right. the Reeds had already lost their oxen and wagons on September 3rd. The family had been right. split up among the other wagons, mostly walking. Concerned that they were traveling even slower than expected when Charles Stanton and William McCutcheon set out, they wanted to send more men for food, but no one volunteered. Kicking Reed out solved that problem. If he wasn't part of the party, he'd have no choice but to go ahead and bring back supplies. I thought there were three men in Reed's group, Milt Elliott and Walter Heron. Those were the men Reed had hired as teamsters for his now non-existent wagons. But looking closer, it looks like only Heron accompanied Reed, while Elliott stayed with the Reed family. So on October 6th Reed set out, arriving at Sutter's Fort October 28th. He would have passed Stanton somewhere along the way. Stanton was able to secure seven mules loaded with food, and arrived back at the party on October 25th, along with the two Indian guides who right. would later be eaten. Reed, having secured further <laughs> supplies, left Sutter's Fort on the 30th. He got caught in the same snowstorm and was forced to retreat back to the fort. It's likely he got within a day or two of the party had it not snowed. He wasn't able to make a separate private attempt to reach the party until the larger rescue parties were formed up. And in fact in running around trying to get help he got caught up in the Mexican-American War and fought in the Battle of Santa Clara. He gathered supplies and men and organized the various relief parties. First relief made it to the trapped immigrants on February 19th and second relief about two weeks later. So while it took longer than expected, Reed likely saved many of the party including his wife and children. Oh, all right, well, still fuck Reed. To me that people attempted to succeed at all without maps, roads, and signs, I imagine. They did have trail for most of the journey at the same time Donner left with the trail cut off. This portion. Wow. Covers the conditions of the party. Oh, wow. Wow, 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 wow. It's wild shit. Now, I just. Germany, we're going. Oh, this son of a bitch, look at him. Was the last survivor to be rescued by the Donner party campsite. This son of a bitch. This is the guy. The Donner party, snowbound, later life. His grave was never found. Wow. But he would outlive all of his daughters. I'm going to say for one, he became penniless, homeless. Oh, wow. What? Okay, hold up. The Innocents later arranged a meeting between and Elsa, the youngest daughter, and the daughter who survived the Donner Party when she was four. Can she swore that he was innocent? And Hankton chose to believe Kiesberg. Kiesberg eventually would outlive all his daughters. He became penniless and homeless and died in Sacramento County Hospital, a hospital for the poor in 1895. His grave was never found. Wow. That was a lot. Hot diggity damn shit. That was a lot. Huh. Holy shit. Wow. All right. Um, well, there it is. The story of 
human travel of just simply a group of people trying to survive, a family trying to make it out to the West, and human expansion of ignorance, unpreparedness, and failure to compromise. An awful time filled with murder, betrayal, cannibalism, maybe wow. some maybe some same-sex love. It's dark, but true. Wild stuff. And that is going to be it for today's show. We're going to be diving more and more into the crazy stuff. All right, I'm going to go raid this person's channel. All right, I'll be back possibly, possibly either tomorrow doing some art or um, next Monday. We're going to be and we're going to dive into another crazy, uh, crazy story. All right. Thank you all for being here. I had so much fun doing this. I hope you all have a great time. And I will see you all in the next episode. That's going to be the episode for Let's Learn, Professor Void. And I hope you all have a wonderful time. Have a wonderful Halloween. Stay safe. Don't eat anybody. And fuck Keysburg, okay?